the chairman of National Cooperative Housing Union, Mr. Francis Kamande, to come and share with us. In Kenya, and many of you are briefly are Kenyans, part of us we are what we are by what Nelly have said here, the cooperative movement. Both of us have been born where we have coffee or milk. Our parents were able to pay our school fees by money generated from the coffee, from the milk, from the tea, and most of those sectors are organized through the cooperative movement. In Kenya, we have a body called Cooperative Alliance of Kenya. It's the alliance that have brought together the cooperative movement under one roof. And we are part of the International Cooperative Alliance, which is based in Switzerland, in Geneva. I happen to be a board member of the CAK. Now, it's a big organization with over six million me uh, members countrywide, whether it's milk industry, whether it's coffee industry, but they are, whether in circles and so on. And for us to be able to ensure we deliver very well, there are several vehicles under the CAK that specialize in different areas. One, for example, is Cusco the body that oversee the saving and credit. And I'm sure some of you are members of circles when you were in, when you were, before you came here. We have a body called KPCU that is specialized in the coffee industry. We have what you call currently the new KCC, another vehicle that's able to address for small scale holder how they, they can be able to benefit, you know, as a group in the milk industry or dairy industry. We also have, and we also said, since we are cooperators, where do we keep our money? Must we go to Barclays Bank, that is basically a UK based on a bank, standard? An idea came to us, why don't we have our bank? And that was the beginning of the Cooperative Bank of Kenya. Then we said, where do we ensure our assets and our properties, including our vehicles? And we said, must we again ensure in the British American insurance? It's a good idea. But we said, let's have our own. And currently in Kenya, we have what we call the Cooperative Insurance Company of Kenya, where the cooperators actually save. That does not limit them. They cannot save in other insurances. We also, another major development in Kenya, those of you have been away for some time, is the formation of a body called KEPSA, Kenya Private Sector Alliance, that came to being in the year 2003 after NAC government. I'm happy to say that the UK, through the UNDP, was highly involved by to create a body where we shall bring together the whole, as I quote, private sector, whether it is transport, whether it is tourism, whether it's now the real estate, whether it's agricultural product, whether it's the cooperative movement, there was need to have a body that is private and that can face the government which is public and try to, to lay out issues that are affecting the private sector, including the uh, Kenya, uh, including the, <clears throat> the people involved in industries and manufacturing. They are, they are actually in the same board. And I'm saying that came in 2003. The body is very, very strong at the moment. We are able to meet, you know, the, the Kenya president at least by annual per year. And we are able to meet the prime minister, what you call the prime minister round table, every three good months. I'm happy to inform you that I'm also a governor in that organization. And a lot is taking place. A lot of engagement with the Kenya government has been very positive. We have been able to raise issues that are affecting the business uh, community and so on. 
The other bitty part of it in our country, as you may be aware, is the new constitution, which obviously you are aware, you must have been involved in it. It is capturing the aspirations and the interests of Kenyans, and is actually a product of compromise. At the moment, what is taking place, that the politicians and other stakeholders, including even KEPSA, we are so highly involved in it, try to, to ensure that we come up with the laws that will be able to help the new constitution to be able to, to work. That, I would say, is the main focus in our country. Number three, the same area, is the formation of counties. As you may be aware, now we are having 47 counties. And this, in our view, will be the epitome of devolution. It will be one of the two tier systems of the government. This is another area, as Nelly was mentioned, some of us think how to invest in our country through the counties. Now, having said so, in the new constitution for the purpose of saving time, we have what we are calling rally rights. In Article number 390 of the Bill of Rights, it says every person has a right, either individually or in association with others, acquire and own property of any description and in, any, in any part of Kenya. So when you want to invest now, there should be no fear of the crash that we had in Rift Valley 2007. The, the, our <clears throat> that has been addressed very well. And there should be no anyth anything that, yeah, I cannot buy a property in a river in Kisum because I don't come from that background. The other point I want to mention very quickly is what Inere have also, Inere have, she has already mentioned. By having now the, the dual citizenship that now is a part of our constitution, it means you can be able to invest in Kenya as you may also be invest where? In UK. You have a home here. In maybe eight months you are here. Four months where? In Kenya. Now, may I quickly say this? That if there are people who have got great privilege by the mass of God, are the men and women who are before me. You are living in UK. And I'm sure you are aware that this country is a great country by all standards. If you look for example the world GDP, like the year 07, the amount of money we created as humanity was in excess of 44 billion Kenya, uh, 44, uh, billion, uh, 44 trillion <laughs> USA dollars. A lot of money. UK is among the 27 biggest economies in the world by then. Now, America was number one. For every Kenya shillings, America was able to contribute in that account of our about that shillings. For every hundred Kenya shillings, maybe I can have a glass. Anybody with a glass? Every hundred Kenya shillings, let's use our, our home language. The US was able to put about 30 shillings. Number two biggest economy then and today is Japan. Was able to put 10 shillings and 10 cents for every 100 shillings. Number three economy then and today is German. Was able to put six shillings and 50 cents. The fourth economy by then, but not today, is actually UK. Was able to put more than four, four shillings. Then followed by France, Italy, and Spain. China was supposed to be the fifth one, but because of the population, we put it aside. But there are, there are some changes now currently. Now, UK is now number six from number four, for whatever the good reasons. But whatever the case, if UK can put four shillings out of a hundred, it's a lot of money. The whole of Africa, the black Africa, 46 countries, when they were only putting in only one shillings and the seven cents of the world economy. The G7 was putting 61 shillings for every hundred. Seven countries with a population of about 12 percent. And the black Africa, basically the same population, we were only putting in one shillings and seven cents. Same population, compare 61 visa, one shillings and seven cents. The gap is enormous. 
And that's why you guys, you are enjoying maybe the best in the world. And I say, congratulations. <laughs> but having said so, I may say one, one or two things. Where does the money of a government come from? There are only three sources. Money driven through agriculture, income driven from industries, and number three, income driven from what we call service sector. Tourism, transport, name it. What maybe some of you may not be aware, because I know you guys are very busy, is that, is that in the year 07, for the G7, where UK is involved, agriculture was contributing between 1 and 2 percent of the economy. US was contributing only 1 percent of the economy. UK, where you are, was contributing only 1 percent of the UK economy. I don't want to be brief, there's no much change. German agriculture was contributing only 0.9 percent of the economy. Japan was 2 percent. In other words, the G7, they can do away with agriculture as a source of, as a source of GDP or wealth. Are with me? But coming to Africa, like our country, agriculture was contributing to 1.5 percent of the GDP. Something very interesting. The industries and the service sector, I call them twin brothers. They are very close. And they prefer to stay in urban setup. That is why for the G7 and where you are, over 80% of, of their people, they stay in urban setup. U.S. currently, 84% are staying in urban setup. U.K. where you are, 86% of the people are staying in urban setup. Australia, 88%. Singapore, 100%. What am I passing over? What can we learn from the G7? If Kenya, I don't then need to be a prophet to say this. The future of Kenya will be people will be living in urban setup because we cannot invent a wheel.